KCRW presents Radio Goes to War. Hello, I'm Will Lewis. When we think of the golden age of radio, we usually think of the great comedians, the absorbing soap operas, and the action-adventure mysteries. Yet it was the late 30s and early 40s that brought the unforgettable voices of reporters and commentators, the Murrows, the Caltonborns, into millions of homes. Just as the Vietnam War was television's first war, World War II became radio's first war. During the next hour, you'll be listening to a selective history of World War II, as told through the actual reports of correspondents broadcasting from the world capitals. You'll hear some of the major figures in mankind's largest war speaking via the medium of international short wave. And you'll relive the outbreak of hostilities in Europe, the events of December 7, 1941, the Normandy invasion, VE Day, and VJ Day, as Americans heard the events on their radios. Interspersed, you'll be listening to the reminiscences of reporters who, along with Ed Murrow and Paul White, help invent electronic journalism. William L. Shira, Charles Collingwood, Eric Severide. All broadcasts are authentic recordings, although many have been edited in the interest of time. Most are presented, wherever possible, in strict chronological order. Now, radio goes to war. Just to bring you up to date on the news of Europe, if you are just turning on your radios, Great Britain is now at war with Germany. Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain announced this fact in a broadcast at 6.15 New York time, 6.15 Eastern Daylight Time. A brief broadcast of about five minutes duration, which was carried over the CBS network. And the Prime Minister said that he had to tell, I have to tell you that we are now at war with Germany. We shall bring you further news as quickly as we have it, and we suggest that you keep tuned to your Columbia station. This is London calling Columbia, New York. Now first, let's get in proper order the chronological developments of the day. At 9 o'clock this morning, London time, it was announced that a two-hour ultimatum had been delivered to Germany, that at the end of that time, hostilities must cease, or Germany and Britain would be at war. At 11.15, the Prime Minister spoke to the nation. I am speaking to you from the cabinet room at 10 Downing Street. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note, stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock, that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. Shortly after the Prime Minister's speech, the air raid sirens went off and it wasn't a pleasant sound. Edward R. Murrow, reporting from London, on September 3rd, 1939. Now to the German capital for the report of William L. Shire. Go ahead, Berlin. Good evening, this is Berlin. The decisive battle of the war has begun. That Adolf Hitler realizes it himself. He made plain in his proclamation to the troops in the West, just as they began to march into the Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg at dawn today. He said... The hour of the decisive battle for the future of the German nation has come. I had made up my mind in the beginning, of course, even when I went up there as a newspaper correspondent, that I would only stay in Nazi Germany as long as I could get the essence of the truth out. Nazi in any dictatorship, you can't uh, tell everything. When the censors cut too much out, I I would just say, okay, it was partly a, a bluff to them, because the Germans wanted you on the air. They figured you weren't friendly. Uh, and you were from a foreign country, but that gave it all the more prestige if they allowed you to broadcast, and you, you were bound to give their point of view sometime. So when they didn't allow enough of my copy, I thought, to, to make the sense I wanted to, I refused to go on the air. You wrote differently. You, you wrote as you... When you wrote a script, you, you wrote it as you you thought it would sound when you spoke. And, of course... I had learned uh, also from from Hitler. Hitler was a man who who could write out a speech, 
and, and the secret was to give it over the radio as if he was speaking out loud. You almost say that radio made Hitler possible, made, it, made his conquest of power possible. There was nobody else. The national stolz and their Zuversicht are stronger than this demonstration of Kraft or as Losenheit and Geschlossenheit of our Volkes. Gehen Sie nun wieder aus mit jenem gläubigen Vertrauen, das Sie durch fast zwei Jahrzehnte als Deutsche und Nationalsozialist im Herzen trugen. Sie haben das Recht, das deutsche Haupt nun wieder mit Stolz erhoben tragen zu dürfen. Wir alle aber haben die Pflicht, es nie wieder unter einem fremden Willen zu beugen. Dies sei unser Erlebnis, so war uns Gott helfe. This is London. History has been made too fast over here today. First in the early hours this morning came the news of the British unopposed landing in Iceland. Then the news of Hitler's triple invasion came rolling into London, climaxed by the German air bombing of five nations. British mechanized troops rattled across the frontier into Belgium. Then at nine o'clock tonight, a tired old man spoke to the nation from number 10 Downing Street. He sat behind a big oval table in the cabinet room where so many fateful decisions have been taken during the three years that he has directed the policy of His Majesty's government. Neville Chamberlain announced his resignation. Mr. Chamberlain's announcement of his resignation was entirely impersonal. Many people consider that it was the best speech he has ever made. Winston Churchill, who has held more political offices than any living man, is now prime minister. He is a man without a party. For the last seven years, he has sat in the House of Commons, a rather lonesome and often bellicose figure, voicing unheeded warnings of the rising tide of German military strength. Now, at the age of 65, Winston Churchill, plump, bald, with massive round shoulders, is for the first time in his varied career of journalist, historian, and politician, the Prime Minister of Great Britain. Mr. Churchill now takes over the supreme direction of Britain's war effort at a time when the war is rapidly moving toward Britain's doorstep. Mr. Churchill's critics have said that he is inclined to be impulsive and at times vindictive. But in the tradition of British politics, he will be given his chance. He will probably take chances, but if he brings victory, his place in history is assured. The historians will have to devote more than a footnote to this remarkable man, no matter what happens. He enters office with the tremendous advantage of being the man who was right. He also has the advantage of being the best broadcaster in this country. Mr. Churchill can inspire confidence, and he can preach a doctrine of hate that is acceptable to the majority of this country. That may be useful during these next few months. Winston Churchill has never been known for his caution, and when he has completed the formation of his new government, you may expect this country to begin to live dangerously. Hitler has said that the action begun yesterday will settle the future of Germany for a thousand years. Mr. Churchill doesn't deal in such periods of time, but the decisions reached by this new prime minister with his boyish grin and his puckish sense of humor may well determine the outcome of this war. Elmer Davis reports on the evacuation of Dunkirk, June 1st, 1940. The evacuation of the remainder of the Channel armies proceeded today, but under greater difficulties and with heavier losses than before. With the clearing up of fogs which had hung over the coast for two days past, the German Air Force got into action again, and withdrawal of troops made it possible for the Germans to bring artillery within range of the shore. They claim to have sunk three warships and eight transports today, besides damaging many others. Whatever truth there is in that, Allied losses were certainly severe. However, it is believed in Paris that about 200,000 men have been got out so far, besides wounded, and that the British, French, and Belgian troops left are not more than 50,000. Some of these are still fighting their way toward the coast, and others who served as a rear guard for the evacuation are dug in on the sands around Dunkirk, with the guns of the Allied fleet serving as their artillery support, hoping that they may yet have a chance to get out too. And the British say that a small number of their troops, surrounded for days past, is still holding out in Calais. Tomorrow, Eric Severide, who came to London after reporting the collapse of French resistance, leaves for Lisbon on the first leg of his journey home. Perhaps you'd like to know what an American reporter thinks about on his last night in London. Three years ago tonight, I sailed from New York with a vague feeling that European history was about to burst of its own centrifugal force and that I wanted a close-up view. For knowledge of what's happening, you have to be here. For understanding, no. 
I still believe the American public has understood better these last few years where Europe was going than any public in Europe. I don't think we thought in direct terms of a form or a style or uh, we weren't being literary historians. But we were given a little block of time. You know, you've got two, three minutes, maybe, maybe four minutes. To do what in that time? You know, we uh, you had to give what news there was. They, and somehow you had to give the background to it. You had to describe the physical environment of the story, if there was one. And out of this grew a kind of personalized news essay thing. Uh, trying not to be editorial and opinionated in it. I didn't have any real idea of the impact in this country till I came back. And that was a oh, whole year later, 13, 14 months later. Then I realized it. I tried to imagine it, but I couldn't. You know, here I was... Uh, young fellow at the Midwest, and I'd sit in some little telephone booth in the French PTT where we did broadcasts and sit down and try to stutter out this stuff. I, I couldn't conceive of that a whole country was listening, let alone really reacting to it. John Daly reports on CBS The World Today, November 17th, 1941. And now... John Bailey. There were many major developments today at home and abroad. The headlines. Germans claim victory in the Crimea. Russians report gains around Moscow and Leningrad. President Roosevelt signs the neutrality law amendment. Captive coal mine strike ties up production and Congress prepares anti-strike legislation. Japanese envoys begin negotiations with the President and Secretary of State Hull. Captured Axis ships revealed as German merchantmen. Those are the highlights. The Germans are also planning to extend their civil administration into Russia. Dr. Alfred Rosenberg has been given the job of restoring public order and public life, as the Nazis put it, in the occupied Russian territories and in the Baltic states. And the theories of Rosenberg give the Russians an idea of what they may expect under Nazi rule. For Rosenberg is an arch enemy of communism and Judaism, and the originator of the ideologies of the Nazi party. It was Rosenberg who drew up the Nazi program of religion, a program that calls for elimination of anything that conflicts with National Socialism, that substitutes Mein Kampf for the Bible and the German sword for the cross. It was Rosenberg who convinced Hitler that the pre-World War type of anti-Semitism could be imported into Germany. He once wrote, When we come to power, Jewish bodies will dangle from every telegraph pole between Munich and Berlin. And he preaches the doctrine that Christianity and Judaism are the religions of weaklings. Now, all civil administrations in occupied Russia will be subordinate to Rosenberg. His spokesman said that the return of private ownership in the eastern areas, as opposed to the communist theory of state ownership, would be within the scope of the Rosenberg administration. Several assistants will be appointed to rule various districts of Russia and the Baltic states under Rosenberg's direction. As to the permanency of the organization, Rosenberg's spokesman said that at present, its assignment is strictly a wartime function. And that's the world today. And now to the editorial room of the Jurgen Journal and Walter Winchell. Good evening, Mr. and Mr. Mr. North and South America, and all the ships and clippers at sea. Let's go to France, France, London. The terms of surrender for the Italian army in Ethiopia have just been handed to Mussolini's representatives. This will give England about 38,000 prisoners, bringing the number of Italian captured in Ethiopia to 200,000. London. Reports persisted in England today that the wife of Rudolf Hess has been arrested by the Nazi police. Vichy. United Press yesterday revealed this attitude by the Vichy government. It was explained that France was grateful for American food, but that this American aid, said France, was very little and unimportant. In fact, the word used was infinitesimal. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the absolute lowdown. How only a few shiploads of food to France helped the war effort of the Germans. Ten shiploads a week amounting to 50,000 tons sent to France, would replace in calorie values 187,500 tons of potatoes, from which could be extracted 16,875 tons of alcohol, which would free 11,000 tons of gasoline 